Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm going to look at the Tier 6 Premium American Heavy Fighter, the Grumman XP-50. Hello there, and here we have the Grumman XP-50, which was a development of the F-5F Skyrocket, a Tier 5 Heavy in this game, although this aircraft was in the game before that one. Um, and in real life was a prototype that took part in a competition to one of the United States Army Air Force's specifications, a competition it lost to uh, another aircraft. And therefore only a single prototype was ever made, and this was lost in a turbo supercharger explosion in May 1941. That sounds quite serious. So we're talking about a, not quite a paper plane, but certainly not one that ever saw active service. And within World of Warplanes, it's designated as a heavy fighter. Well, it's barely that, as you'll find out. Uh, we're going to look at the numbers next. As usual, if you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use the link below to skip ahead to another part of the video. Here's the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 6 heavies. Uh, there are seven of them. And I'm going to take a moment to explain how the spreadsheet works. If you know that already, skip ahead to the part where I discuss the numbers for the aircraft. So we have the Grumman XP-50 in columns C and D here, and then each of the other heavies has two columns of its own off to the right. So the P-38J Lightning is in E and F, and so on and so on. Down the left, we have the information that you can see in the hangar UI. It's been supplemented by information on the guns, specifically auto aim angle, dispersion angle, and overheat time. Those come from a third party website. And in the body of the table here, which I'm circling, I hope you can see, we have the numbers for the aircraft. On the color coding, green indicates a best in class figure, light blue a second best in class figure, light purple a third best class in figure, and a gold color behind the name of the aircraft indicates that it's a premium or a reward aircraft, such as the Grumman XP-50 is. For the purposes of the comparison, the aircraft were taken back to stock configuration, ordnance where available was mounted, equipment was removed, pilot was sent back to the um, barracks, and modules are all top. And then using red colors, you reverse the logic for worst in class figures, and you'll see quite a bit of red there for the Grumman XP-50. Okay, so let's move on to discuss the statistics of the aircraft. Let's start with the business end of the aircraft as usual, and we'll look at the gun armament. And we're not going to look at this part of the, the uh, spreadsheet first. We're actually going to look at this part because what you need to know is that the rating and the cumulative DPS are both worst in class. And they're worst in class by quite some distance. This is a very lightly armed heavy fighter. So what have we actually got? Well, we've got a pair of 20mm cannons, a um, range of nearly 2,300 feet, the rate of fire is 400 and the DPS of each gun is 90. Um, the auto aim angle, and auto aim is the amount you can be off target by and the game will correct your aim and allow you to hit your target, is a fairly stingy 2 degrees. You can often expect to see a bit more than this. For instance, if we look at the Volte XP-54, it's almost double at 3.5 degrees. That said, the dispersion angle, which is how quickly the bullets spread out once they leave the muzzle of the cannon or the gun, is 0.4. This is pretty good for cannons. Uh, you can often see 0.5 or 0.6, as, I, as you can see I'm highlighting here on the Volte XP-54, the ME410. And the overheat time is a pretty decent 8 seconds. Okay, all of the other aircraft, with the exception of the ME410's biggest guns, um, have 8 seconds as well. But with a low DPS uh, aircraft, you are looking to have a higher rather than the lower overheat time. Can do something about burst length. Let's see what I did when uh, we look at the section where I set the aircraft up a bit. We've also got a pair of 50 cals and with nearly 1900 feet of range. Still an auto aim angle of 2, uh, still stingy. Uh, if we look at the Voltees, auto aim angle is a whacking great 5 although the dispersion angle is 0.8, and here on the Grumman XP-50, it's 0.6. Uh, that's not too bad for machine guns. And the overheat time is 25 seconds, so unless you're f f shooting at a very high hit point pool aircraft, uh, you're not going to worry about overheating these guns particularly. But this package is more like a light fighter in terms of its damage output. Is it good news on the ordnance? Well, no, not really. Um, if it weren't for the fact that the Volte doesn't carry any ordnance at all, it'd be worst in class by a long, long way again, even behind the KI-102. 
It's certainly not a match for the P38J Lightning with uh, its considerable ordnance load and indeed the two Mosquitoes. And even the ME410's rockets are rated more highly by quite some uh, distance and the XP50's bombs. Basically these will take out a gun emplacement and I question whether it's really worth mounting these. Yes, there may be the odd occasion when you're over a sector and you just need to take out one small ground target to flip it and these bombs would come in handy. But do you really want to uh, wait for that opportunity to come along and do you really want to drop altitude to do it? We look at survivability. Well, again, it's more like a light fighter. It's the worst in class. If we just scroll down, which is what I was starting to do, you look at the first three figures, the hit points, damage resistance, and the rating, worst in class figures. The fire resistance is 60. It's actually okay. There's only two, cho three choices here. And the Volti XP54, interestingly, is the worst in class with 50. Always need to try and set a Volti on fire. Airspeed, well, most of the heavies are much of a muchness. Even the fairly lumbering um, Ki-102 and Mosquitoes are about as fast as uh, even the fastest of the aircraft, which again is the Volti. Um, the Grumman XP-50 is well up there, and I want to draw your attention to the maximum boost speed. It's best in class, and that's going to be important when we discuss altitude performance and weight for it. As far as boost uh, duration is concerned, you've got two choices on the heavies at tier six. It's either 25 seconds or it's 30. We've got the lower figure here, but there's not much to choose between any of the aircraft. Dive speed is a somewhat disappointing 497, and I wouldn't recommend trying to dive away from, well, certainly other heavies. Um, I'm not even sure I would want to dive away from fighters and multi-rolls. Um, and there is a, a much better escape tactic that uh, I'll talk about in a moment anyway. So. Not a great dive speed. Maneuverability, well, the KO-102 is always, has always been very maneuverable and the Volti, which has been introduced more recently, is also extremely maneuverable. It's about on a par with the P-38J Lightning. If you really have to, you might engage in a turn fight with one of these. Um, I wouldn't, you could just about do it. You'll lose to a Volti, you'll lose to the KO-102. However, it is worth knowing that if an ME410 or the two Mosquitoes engage in a turn fight with you, you will probably win. And altitude performance. With the exception of the Mosquitoes, there's not much to choose between um, the heavies. The Lightning's best in class, um, but the Grumman XP50 is right up there with the Volti and the ME410. And then there's a really important figure here. Climb rate is 372. Now, apart from the Lightning, uh, where you might be able to get in turn fight and win. What you can do with this climb rate and this maximum boost speed is boost away upwards very steeply from, away from any of the other heavies, provided you're not already near your maximum um, altitude. And you're not often going to get to your service ceiling of 13,123. So it's going to be a viable tactic. And I strongly recommend that you do this not only with other heavies, but you do it with fighters and multi-rolls because they will stall out be uh, underneath you probably. And you'll be able to do a hammerhead turn, quickly quickly flip your aircraft over and come down on them if you wish. Or alternatively, once you're high enough, you can just fly away and do something else. So bear that in mind as an escape tactic. This aircraft has a really good climb rate. It has really good boost speed um, in order to make the most of that climb rate. And there is a way of increasing these two figures, which we'll discuss in the setup. If we look at the worst in class figures, we've already dealt with the guns. We know they're the worst in class and by a long distance. We already know that the ordnance is nothing to write home about. We already know that the survivability is not great. Um, the maximum dive speed there is actually, I think, second worst in class. So again, emphasizing that diving is not the way to save your aircraft. Stall speed, 99. Oh, you're not going to be using that as a tactic either, um, trying to slam on the brakes and make things go past you. Um, and the altitude performance, again, don't worry about the red here. The altitude figures are fairly compressed. So where does that position this aircraft? Well, it's not really a heavy fighter in my opinion, and nor is it good at ground attacking. So what this is great at is picking off lightly armored targets, targets that aren't paying attention, which means um, uh, heavies that you catch unawares. And if you're careful, bot bombers, 
Um, I'd be careful about taking on heavily armed human bombers with this because the survivability figure means that, uh, particularly if you go behind one of the carpet bombers, unless you happen to know about the blind spots on the B-17D and the B-17G, you're going to be in trouble. And I'm, I'm very much fight shy of going after a B-32 from behind, underneath or above, but not behind. And if you get in trouble, remember what I said, vertical climbing is your friend. Okay. This is not an aircraft for newer players, in my opinion. This is a high skill cap aircraft. It's a challenge for good players and they may enjoy that. But as a newer player, you will probably find this very difficult and very frustrating. OK, I think that's enough about the numbers. Let's go and see how I've set the plane up. Here we are back on the tarmac looking at the Grumman XP-50 and we're going to discuss how I've set the aircraft up and then move on to pilot skills. Uh, the first thing to mention though is that uh, this aircraft is specialised so I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. Let's see what you'd be missing uh, when you first acquired the aircraft. Uh, bearing in mind that you've got no equipment slots on the airframe uh, under either stock or specialist configuration, you'd be missing one of the equipment slots on the engine and likewise you'd be missing one of the slots consumable slots on the engine as well. Let's pop that back into specialist configuration and let's talk about how I've set this aircraft up. So let's begin with the cockpit and we have a choice of cockpit armour or gun sight. Well, I always mount gun sights on my fighters. Uh, I don't think there's a single instance of any form of fighter, multi-role fighter or heavy fighter, um, where I've uh, put on cockpit armour. So it's the gun sight. It's not fully specialised, uh, sorry, it's not enhanced to its highest level, nor is it calibrated to the highest level. I often don't do that with my lower tier aircraft, I prefer to spend the materials on the higher tier aircraft. But if I were to get it up to ultimate level, what would I do with the bonus characteristics? Yeah, it's quite interesting actually. Very often with heavy fighters, fighters, multi-rolls, I'd be looking to pick off the 5 and 3% extra accuracy, the 4th and 5th items there. Uh, depending on whether or not I've mounted a first aid kit as a consumable, I might pick off the pilot's resistance to injuries, or I might pick off the 10% um, chance of inflicting critical damage. But here's the thing. You've got very low DPS with this aircraft, and it's going to be important if you're engaging with an aircraft to try and cripple it with um, that low DPS. I think there's a fairly strong argument for actually picking off um, both the 5% and the 10% uh, chance of uh, inflicting critical damage, hopefully an engine, and also a 10% chance of uh, causing a fire. Um, and probably with this aircraft, that's what I do, just to try and get something more out of the DPS that I've got. There's nothing you can do with equipment as regards the airframe. We don't have a slot, so let's move straight on to the engine where we have two slots. And I'm going to highlight this second piece of equipment, the boost mixture injection system. This, I think, is a mandatory choice, or as near mandatory as any choice of equipment ever is. And the reason for that is that this piece of equipment will improve both your uh, maximum boost speed and also your climb rate, which are the two features of this aircraft that are better than any other heavy at tier six. Now the base figures were 416 miles an hour for maximum boost speed and 372 feet per second for the climb rate. Let's go and see what this advanced piece of equipment, it's not ultimate and it's not calibrated, so therefore there's more to come, has been. We close up the gun armament, the airspeed, we can see the boost speed has gone up to 434 maximum and you'll probably get that up to somewhere near 450 don't know the exact figure because I don't have the equipment in the right configuration. That is ultimate level and fully calibrated, but that's very useful. And as far as the altitude performance is concerned, the rate of climb has gone up from 372 to 405. I guess you're going to be able to get something like 420, uh, and that will improve your chances of escaping for air, from aircraft in a vertical climb, which is what I've recommended. What have we got as ter in terms of bonus characteristics? Again, I haven't configured these, so I'm just looking at these. I've got 15% engine cooldown rate across two characteristics here. Um, and I think I'd probably pick off the 5% boost availability. Um, I never feel that 1% acceleration and 1% maximum speed and another half percent are, are worthwhile characteristics there. And basically, the cooldown rate means you get your boost back quicker. 
and the max the um, boost availability is not reduced by as much if you pick off the 5% um, shown there. Whilst we're at it, let's just have a look and see what the boost duration has come down to, 22 seconds. Um, if, you, if I at some point select the 5% boost availability, that will probably go back up to 23, which will be down about 2 seconds from the, the base figure. As far as the other slot is concerned, I suppose you do have a choice here um, between the uprated engine and the lightweight power unit. Um, if you want a bit more manoeuvrability than, um, to deal with, for instance, P38J Lightnings, then this would be the choice for you, but you're never going to be able to compete with specialised Voltes or KA102s, and that's what discourages me from picking off this piece of equipment. So, despite the adverse effect on the fire resistance of the aircraft, which is 60 at base, we have a quick look at the survivability right now, it's gone down to 53 already, and this is only an improved level of equipment, so that effect is going to get a bit worse, um, quite a bit worse actually, when I get this up to ultimate level. Um, I've mounted an uprating, uprated engine to, in order to pr improve the cruise speed. Cruise speed is 335, uh, improved piece of equipment, just taking it up 9 miles an hour from 324. Uh, I guess you're going to be able to get that up, um, what, another 18, 20 miles an hour? And make this aircraft quite slippery through the air. The thing you are going to have to watch out for is the um, survivability problem, the familiar one with resistance to fire. Now given I've uh, you know, used these aircraft as crew trainers and I don't specifically build in skills to the pilots which deal with um, the effects of fire, I may find myself having to take off this first aid dressing package and putting on a fire extinguisher if I continue with to mount the uprated engine. If I don't like the effect and it's really bad, I may actually go and put on a lightweight uh, um, power unit simply because it avoids that uh, and I can make use of the extra manoeuvrability. So there you go, those are the choices on the engines that I've made so far but there are viable alternatives as I've just discussed. Let's just take a quick look at bonus characteristics before we move on um, for the uprated engine that is and as we can see currently I've got 1% acceleration without boost uh, what else would I probably pick here? Um, definitely pick the 10% resistance to fire, um, offsetting the adverse effect of this engine. That's the fifth characteristic. And then I'd probably pick off another 1% cruise speed and a half percent cruise speed. I'm already dealing with boost speed uh, using the um, air boost injection system. Okay. So let's now have a look at what we've done with the forward firing weapon slot. And I've put on long, long gun barrels here. Um, on the basis that I want to be able to do damage at longer range, which means that with the burst rate, rate I've got, I can keep on doing damage sooner as I come into range of an aircraft and for the maximum amount of time available. However, this isn't the only viable choice. We'll discuss them all in some detail. Uh, just quickly to step through the bonus characteristics. Um, you've got a chance of inflicting critical damage, uh, accuracy uh, and a burst length which um, I, I offsets the uh, diminution of uh, the burst length. Would I pick these all off? Well, again, using the logic I used on the um, gun site, I think I'd probably concentrate here on inflicting co uh, critical damage. So the first one, 5%, there's a 10% chance of inflicting critical damage. Um, and then I think I'd pick off the extra 5% damage inflicted by forward firing offensive armament, offensive armament there. So again, I'd be seeking to make the absolute most of the limited DPS I've got by trying to increase the chances of criticals and extra damage. So that's the long gun barrels that I fitted. Shall we just have a look at the ranges? The base range, if you remember, for the cannons was 2,297 feet. It's now 2,526 feet, which I think is very usable. And the machine guns have gone up from 1,877 feet to 2,064. I like that. However, there's another way of inflicting more damage, albeit a shorter range. And we could put on, for instance, the... Um, in fact, there are two ways. Let's discuss the gas-operated action first. This will increase the rate of fire. Let's just see if we've got a gas-operated action piece of equipment lying around and see what happens to the DPS. I've got an ultimate piece of equipment, so let's sling that on. Uh, and immediately what we'll see is that uh, this is probably not calibrated, no it's not, so there's more to come, but the cumulative damage has gone up to 326 from the 288 that's the base. 
Okay, that's useful. You might even think that's great. Um, just have a quick look at the bonus characteristics and see what we've got. Chance of causing a fire. Uh, you can also cool the guns down a bit quicker with two characteristics. You can also pick our second characteristic for ca causing a fire and for accuracy there. I'll probably go for causing a fire or based on the logic that I want to do as much with this limited DPS as possible. Increase the chances of causing uh, a damaging fire and then maybe pick off the cooldown rate as well. Um, the problem is, is the loss of range again. Not entirely happy about that with this piece of equipment, but it's a possibility and it might be worth experimenting with. The other choice is that you could actually increase the burst length and I've only got s improved equipment here. So the burst length is not shown in the hangar UI of course, that's a hidden statistic so I can't tell you how much it would go up by unless I do some maths. Basically that's um, eight, nearly 8% 8 increase on the burst length. So I guess it's going to take it, for instance, on the cannons from about 8 seconds to 8.7. And then maybe you'll get up to 9. Um, I don't think this is going the way quickly enough um, that I would, um, for me to consider this seriously. If we just look at the bonus characteristics again. Got more cooldown rate, rate of fire, rate of fire, cooldown, more burst length and more accuracy. Well... If you were going to mount this, you'd probably go for the burst length, and then probably you'd want the weapons to cool down as quickly as possible as well. I'm going to stick with the gu long gun barrels for the moment, but I would personally be very interested in trying um, gas-operated action. I don't think I'm quite so interested in trying the reinforced bolt carriers. We'll move on to consumables in a moment, but just quickly to note, if I do mount the gas-operated action here instead of the long gun barrels, even though the cumulative damage will go up, it will still probably be worst in class, um, despite the effects of the gas-operated action. So that's something to bear in mind before you decide to mount that piece of equipment. You're not going to be able to make this suddenly a monster with large uh, heavy-hitting weaponry. On the consumables, for the moment I've got the first aid kit. If I'm following behind anything with a rear gun, I like to heal the pilot as soon as possible. If I continue with the uprated engine and take it to higher levels and that risk of damage, fire damage becomes too great, I might have to swap to a fire extinguisher. Pneumatic control assist to help me in a tight spot, probably with other heavies, maybe a lightning in particular. It's not going to help much with a Volti or a Ki-102. Um, engine cooling, if you've any boost at all, this will add 10 seconds to it. And the engine restart. Um, the aircraft might benefit, I guess, from the improved mixture control, but then if you lose the engines, you're more or less a sitting duck. So I think the restart is the right choice for me, for sure. And then universal ammunition on the guns. Okay, so let's discuss pilot skills. As with most of my premiums, I use uh, this aircraft as a crew trainer. Don't actually have a pilot selected. Um, and that means that the pilot may... Um, need skills which are slightly different to those that would be optimal for this aircraft um, because basically they're being configured for the other aircraft. If we just stick in this pilot for the moment, which I whom I haven't trained, this is the pilot that came with the aircraft when I first acquired it and I've not used him, um, what would we do? Well, the chances are you're going to have at least Oh, and I would strongly recommend that you have a combined injection boost system. So probably the first skill I would pick, despite the fact that I've actually got the engine guru one picked on this pilot, is the aerodynamics expert. And then I'll be seeking to build up both of these two locks here. So probably engine guru one next, then um, marksman one. I probably, as soon as I got a third skill point, having consumed two here, I'd take this off and put on engine guru two and then I'd start build, building up the marksman skills. Um, and then a long way in the future, if I don't go for aerobatics expert, eh, it's not a bad choice. Uh, but if I was on the way to resilience, I might pick aerobatics expert, and then I might take that off and put it on resilience. Those would be my choices, but that would be a long way in the future. Um, typically, I will put a pilot such as my Sabre pilot in here. Let's just go and find him. There he is, he's actually at the top, that's convenient. 
if we just look at the ratings, you can see that the maneuverability has gone up from a base of 41 to 43 with this air um, set of skills combined with this equipment. So even with a highly trained pilot, um, the effect on maneuverability, and he has got aerobatics, um, by the way, there, is not great. You're still not going to get up to the Volte level or the KO 102 level. Just look at altitude performance and airspeed. See the boost speed is now up to 448. The cruise speed has increased appreciably as well. Let's close that up. Oops, open up survivability. See the rate of climb has now gone up to 435. So skills are important, skills are critical. And that's why I would pick this one first to try and improve these figures as much as possible. Okay, I think it's time to go and see how this aircraft performs in battle. Our map for the forthcoming battle is Scorching Sands. It's the invasion variant with five sectors laid out in the five spots of a die configuration. Um, we have a line of garrisons, one each nearest the spawn points and one in the centre. That one is tactically important because it gives easy access to the rest of the sectors. Otherwise, these are the mate wakes in the game. And then the important um, sectors are the two air bases on the other axis about the central garrison. And these allow you to spawn, which is useful if you want to get across to the enemy sectors. Um, you can select a new aircraft of the same tier if you want to change your uh, plane mid-battle, or you can get full repairs. And the way to win this battle is to hold your local garrison, which often comes under threat from bombers and ground attackers, I should warn you. The central garrison for long as possible and at least one of these air bases. And if you hold, say, these three here, you're probably going to have a very good chance of at some point taking this during the game and maybe even that as well. Look at the order of battle, we can see I'm top tier in my XP-50 and this aircraft does struggle against tier 7 so your best battles are probably going to come when you're top tier. And I have for company a tier 5 Junkers 87G ground attacker on the enemy side. They have a very very tricky heavy I mustn't get in front of the ME410, otherwise my aircraft will melt. However, I can outmaneuver it, so that's going to be an interesting set of encounters if we come across each other. And then we have the XF4U-1, which is a tricky tier 5 fighter. Right, let's see how this battle worked out. Before we start this battle, I'll mention that this is a natively recorded file. It's not one of World of Warplanes replay files. And the benefit of that, as probably you're beginning to realise, is that the gun sight or reticle will be properly aimed and you'll be able to see me zooming in and out uh, as I use sniper mode or look around the aircraft. The disadvantage is that the movements of the aircraft may be a bit more jerky, um, but for the moment I'm going to continue to use natively recorded files because most people seem to prefer the gun sights being accurately aimed and not being thrown off by the World of Warplanes replay files. Okay, so that said, let's get started. And um, I'm going to go for the local garrison because it's right in front of me, of course, and then almost always on this map, I swing to the airfield, which is down in the south there. So we're looking for the air defense heavies first. Strip that down well enough, but uh, certainly not as quick as uh, the ME410 will be dealing with the air uh, defence heavies, I'm quite sure. Now, I just managed to finish off that air defence heavy before the sector finally flipped, so I've got two to my credit. And we're off to the airfield that I mentioned. In the meantime, the enemy have captured their local garrison. That's normal at the start of this battle. Now we're going to tussle over the other three sectors. First air defence heavy comes into view. Down he goes. Looking for the other one, nowhere to be seen at the moment, so I look at the air defence for uh, light fighters. Go for the one right at the end. Longest time on target. 
and it also doesn't encourage the others to turn for me. Don't quite destroy it, and that's not really surprising with this DPS. Get on the tail of an F4U, which simply circles in front of me. Destroy that, and we capture this sector. Flip the aircraft around, looking for enemy incoming enemy aircraft. There are a pair of them. Bow fighter. Need to keep an eye on the multi-roll as well. The F4F. So you see, I shot the bow fighter and then switched target to the F4F, which flies straight on conveniently. I've damaged its engine. Those criticals are working for me, and now I readdress re the bow fighter. Both I try can outmaneuver. That puts me on the XF4U, which is a human player. It doesn't last too long in front of those guns. Probably is only a tier 5. Now I'm going to chase down the ground attackers. I did mention that they tend to, along with the bombers, fly to your uh, local garrison. And inconveniently, you often find it being lost and you have to retrace your steps and go and take it back. So I'm trying to prevent that. So I destroyed one ground attacker, it blew up behind me after I'd flown past it because it was on fire. Take a little bit of a risk there with this DPS, but I do destroy the ground attacker before I ram straight into the back of it. Having prevented uh, the, bit, the threat to our local garrison, I'm now beginning to gain altitude, and unsurprisingly I can see bombers face, uh, heading here. Well, one of the class specific missions for the heavies is to shoot down ground attack aircraft on bombers, so I'm quite happy to do so. And you can see I'm struggling to actually finish that aircraft off. It actually blew up under the fire that I'd inflicted. There's another PE2, so we'll take that as well. So far, I haven't been harassed by the ME410. Pretty manoeuvrable aircraft, the PE2, so I'm actually struggling to stay on target. Now I've got some distance, I should be able to get my guns to bear. I only get the assistance this time. Battle seems to be going quite well at the moment. We have three sectors to the enemy's one. As is often the case under these circumstances, that means I get to pick what targets I want to attack instead of being harassed and having to fight my way out of trouble. Go down for the ground attacker. Steep dive there and agile enough to pull out of it. Now I come back for the ground attacker again. Another ground attacker is coming in. And for the first time I see the ME410. And he's concentrating on something else. Now I'm behind him. He's in serious trouble. He's not going to outmaneuver me. His rear weapon isn't enough to be able to deter me. He's got other aircraft on him anyway. Just about avoided flying through my own aircraft there. I'm not sure I actually did avoid it. I didn't get the kill there, but I certainly contributed heavily towards it. That puts me underneath the bomber, and you can see how quickly I got up to the bomber there. There isn't much to commend about this aircraft, but that climb rate is something special. Diving on the XF4U-1 again. Secure the kill from one of my bots. I'm sure he won't mind. Ground attacker is coming in again. It's pretty isolated, so I'm free to attack him without worrying about what else is going on. Swing the aircraft around. I not quite finish him off and probably won't now. He's actually got more health than I thought, so actually I probably will get to finish him off. 
and I do. And the Hero of the Sky Badge goes through. So I've been doing my class specific missions. I have been concentrating on taking ground attacks and heavies quite deliberately. So that's certainly helped. Begin to climb to see what's at higher altitudes. And we see the ME410 below me, again in a position of disadvantage. Wind Legend goes through. And since it's such a dangerous aircraft, having got into a position where I have it at a disadvantage, I'm not going to let it go unless I'm forced to by his friends. Uh, it wasn't me firing off target wildly, that was me getting my finger on two buttons at once. The fire button as well as one of the yaw buttons. And for the second time I don't get the kill. I think that's just after the score line, so that's a very dangerous opponent out of the way, and I'm pleased about that. I decide not to fly into the fur ball, I'm very nearly on my own. I decide to find other things to do. And as I can feel that there are bullets being fired at me, and I am being chased, as you can see I'm looking back, I employ this tactic of going up in the air, flying away, and in this case selecting a different target, a rather dangerous Yak-7. Fortunately I so seriously damage it before it can get its gun to bear on me that I blow it up. And now I can attack the airfield. Bot bli obligingly wheels in front of me so I can keep shooting him. And he goes. And we have the airfield. And basically this game is won. I can pick up repairs and look to see if there's any final damage that I can do. And the XF4U-1 is a victim. I quickly repair my engine. I don't know what's behind me. I use this tactic of going ver almost what, as near vertical as possible to get away from whatever was attacking me. Fortunately for me, it was the Yak-7 taken out by our own Yak-7. There we go. Nearly 19,000 personal points and a whole heap of medals. Let's review the outcome of this battle, and as we can see from the centre, it's a 5 chevron battle, or a grade 1 heavy fighter, which grossed 178,038 credits, or silver if you prefer, and of that, very nearly 60,000 came from a premium account bonus. Look in the message box, we can see there were no expenses, the aircraft wasn't shot down, so no repair expenses, and I was using prepaid consumables. 5,278 experience, the base is 2,070 there, has a premium account bonus of just over 1,000 and then liveries and boosters account for the rest. And again, don't get too excited by the free experience, base is 212 with 51 coming from a premium account bonus and then boosters account for the rest, the vast majority of the rest. No tokens on this occasion, however there are five epic achievements, a Maguire's, a Marseille, a Winged Legend, a Campbell's and a Hero of the Sky. Turning to the personal score tab, we can see that two of the three class-specific missions are complete. Uh, the other one is four-fifths complete, and hence the five chevrons. 18,910 personal points, three sectors captured, 18 targets shot down, 7,522 damage to aerial targets, with 32 critical hits coming off those cannons, quite nice. Didn't lose the aircraft, and 560 capture points received. That was divided 320 for defending, and 240 for attacking. We look at the team score, we can see that was easily enough for first place both by chevrons and by personal points across both teams. Nice contribution from the rather difficult Junkers 87G player here. Uh, on the enemy side, you would have expected the two human players to be at the top, and these are decent contributions. It was a nice battle to win. That brings me to the end of my discussion of the Grumman XP-50, an aircraft that I feel is suitable for experienced players of the game, but not newer ones. The latter will struggle with the low DPS and relative fragility of this aircraft, and most of its other characteristics are average. 
If you are tempted to try your hand, make use of the good maximum boost speed and the excellent climb rate. They will serve you well. Well, I hope you found that useful and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. And I am about to sign out at this part of the video. But before I do, let me mention that coming up, there's an unnarrated bonus feature, another battle. Enjoy that. And I will see you again next time. This is the Noble Q signing out. You are approaching the area of combat operations. Be ready.